I'm pleased to welcome to Inside Athletics the 2005 world champion Lauren Williams. Lauren, thanks for joining me on Inside Athletics. Tell me about how your U.S. championships went this weekend. I think I had a pretty good USA, USA championships this year. 11-0, um, I haven't seen that since 2009. Uh, it's been wow. a long time coming for me. So. Now, uh, you don't know it yet, but the real, purposes of this, the real purpose of this interview is for me to convince you that at age 29, it probably is not a good time for you to retire since, as you just said, you just ran 11 flat. But um, did that 11 flat that you ran this weekend give you any kind of pause as to, you know what, all right, so I'm turning the big 3-0 this year. There are a lot of sprinters running well into their 30s. Tyson Gay, Justin Gatlin come to mind. Mona Lee had a very good U.S. championships. Is there anything about this weekend that gives you a little bit of uh, pause to that decision, decision? No pause at all. I feel like it gave me closure even. Really? Um, I watched English Gardner go out there and run, and I really felt like that was me 10 years ago. I came into the sport after winning NCAA championships. I'm, I actually think she even ran a similar time to me. I ran 10.96 or something. Yeah. And I immediately turned my focus. It was the Olympic year for me. And I came out here, I had nothing to lose, everything to gain, and I was just a free spirit. And I don't feel that, that freeness anymore. I feel you know, a sense of obligation when I compete. And I don't like that. Now, a lot of people know that Sonia Richards-Ross was born in Jamaica. A lot of people may know, even know that Karan Clement was born in Trinidad. But I don't think that the wider track and field public, certainly the fans, know that your father is from Tobago. Mm -hmm. Now, I know he was instrumental in your career. Tell me exactly what role he played in Lauren Williams, the athlete. My father was my biggest fan. Um, you know, my mom loves to take credit for 50% of the genetics. <laughs> well, I would hope so. I feel like I'm like 80% my dad and maybe like 20% my mom. Okay. Hopefully she you realize bi this. biologically that's impossible, <laughs> <Right>. but okay. <laughs> uh, but he was just, you know, a biggest fan and always, you know, encouraging me, doing everything he could to help me, whether it be driving, you know, four or five hours to a race, uh, raising money to get me shoes because I'm one of seven children. So right. sometimes it wasn't easy, things like that. But he definitely was a big supporter uh, making sure that I reach my full potential. Now I know that when he passed um, soon after Beijing, to me, I've known you for a long time. It seems like something changed in you. You have never been the same since your father passed. You think you can tie his passing to you feeling like, you know what, I just want to go on with the next chapter of my life post track and field. I can definitely say that there is um, a, a medium percentage that, that that's attributed to my dad passing away. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of looking back over it, you know, I used to say it wasn't a big deal when he came or when he didn't come, but all the races that I PR'd, every time I PR'd, he was there. Wow. And uh, every breakthrough race, he was there. Like, even for uh, 1087, which is my PR mm -hmm. um, in Zurich, that was the first time he had come to Europe, you know, outside of the regular, well, the big championship. Right. So, um, definitely he played a major role, and I was always out there trying to please my father. So since you've decided you're retiring, let's, let me go back into some of the, the Lauren Williams uh, archives for some of your races. First of all, um, just in glancing through your, your career, and I've followed your career, I've covered most of your career, so I know it well. It seems to me like nobody in history has the luck in the 4x1 that you had. In 2005, you're world champion in the 4x1. In 2007, you're world champion in the 4x1. In 2008, the stick's on the ground, right? In 2004, the stick's on the ground. So two Olympic drops with you somewhere involved. Who's to blame? We don't know. And then last year, after people have counted you out, maybe ah, it's time to retire, you get Olympic gold. How will you remember your career for the U.S. 4x1? As a bittersweet thing, for sure. Start with the bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's hard because at 04 and 08, you know, like you said, with the, the botched handoffs, um, I definitely spent a little bit of time of, you know, self-reflecting, was it my fault, that sort of thing. And I've managed not to drop a stick any other time. You know, many times in my career, you know, March and April, we were doing relays just to have fun and, you know, kind of race ourselves into shape. Right. And you meet the person on the same day. Hi, my name is Lauren. How many steps do you need? <laughs> and we managed never to drop the stick. So how on the biggest stage? <laughs> Two times, not right. once, but With all the preparation and planning exactly. and practice. Exactly. Right. How does this happen? Right, so right. I was sort of baffled by it. And, you know, I was a little bit nervous going into 2012. Like, uh, you know, anything can happen with those people doing doubles and stuff like that. What if they really call my number? What if, you know, what if I choke and do it again? Like, mm. 
so there was a little bit of added pressure there, but I wanted that team to do well. I know that we've been world record pace a few times. So, uh, yeah, it was bitter from the standpoint of, you know, having to, to, to play that role and support, knowing it was a supporting role from the very beginning. But it was sweet seeing us get it done and knowing that USA had world record team, world record times, world record people all along. I remember being in Beijing and watching what happened in both the relays. I don't think I've ever seen you that upset. I remember you going back to retrieve that baton on the ground and with tears in your eyes running that final 100 meters. So you were obviously very upset, as anyone would be. You then said, it's almost like somebody has a voodoo doll and they're just sticking the pins in us. And for some reason, everybody on the island of Jamaica went, oh, she's talking about us. Tell me about that statement and how crazy that got in, in, the, in the days and weeks after that. Yeah, I was totally f framed in some sort, <laughs> form, or fashion because, yeah, my words were misconstrued. I never yeah. once mentioned the word Jamaica in the, the setting of it all or was I even thinking along those lines. And uh, there was a lot of uh, backlash from it. You know, the Jamaican athletes wouldn't look my direction. Wow. Uh, like, I mean, just grimacing and walking the other direction. A lot of nasty hate mail, things like that from my website. And wow. There was no Twitter at that time for me. Right. But, Luckily. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But even in Miami, where there's a large Jamaican population, I got back in. You know, just in the grocery store, sometimes people come up to me and say nasty things. So, wow. And it was very hurtful and very harmful like to my, my spirit, just because I never meant it like that. Right, right. So and, it was and, I know, and I know your history in Jamaica. You won your World Junior title there. Um, I've already talked about the fact that you're, you know, your, your father's from Tobago. Um, you, it seems to me like you still, you, I mean, obviously that you're, you're over it and everybody else got over it and maybe cooler heads have prevailed. But um, it seems to me like you've always had such a great following in the Caribbean. Now that you look back on it and you look back on Beijing, um, you feel like there are some life lessons that you can learn from what happened in Beijing because you were fourth to the Jamaican sweep. It's the, you know, the first time in a major meet you didn't get a medal. I know how devastated you were for that. And then to have the, the stick end up on the ground, you left Beijing. It had to be absolutely devastating. Forget track and field now. Do you feel like there are things that happened to me in Beijing, there are lows that I felt in Beijing that I can take forward, like maybe for the rest of my life? For sure. <laughs> I mean, it, to sum it up, life isn't fair. And, and one thing that people maybe, maybe don't know about Beijing is that I felt like I was in the best shape of my life. Yeah. To this day, I don't know a time that I felt better. Like I lined up and, you know, there were eight people and I'm still convinced I could have ran a time that, that could have got me to gold medal. If he would have said on your mark sooner or, <laughs> you know, five seconds later, you know, yeah. like it's just all about timing at the time. But fitness wise, I was ready to run the same and it was heartbreaking. The whole meet was heartbreaking to a point where, you know, usually some people get that vengeance and they go for the rest of the season and they, they show what they can do. But I didn't even want to run the rest of the season yeah, at that point. You were so that upset. I, yeah, I wasted a really good, like I said, condition in my life. Like I was a really good timing. So I think it's just that idea that life isn't fair, but you got to get up, you got to keep fighting. And, and that's what I didn't do at that time. And I, and I look back and I wish I had. Well, I know you well enough to know that. Um the person that's inside of you is an amazing person and I know that whether you do in fact as you say call it off and call it a career this year no matter what you do next you're gonna be good at it so thanks for joining me all the best to you thank you